Hello, everybody. Very nice to see you again for this uh, new webinar, Sonoscanner. Uh, today, I'm very, very uh, happy and, uh, and glad to introduce you the great uh, Dr. Hervé Picard, who is MD in Paris, uh, passionate by ultrasound. We have been uh, doing several webinars uh, with him in, uh, in French language, and uh, you have been uh, uh, very many to ask us to, 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 to share this, uh, this knowledge uh, and uh, Dr. Picard patient in English. So uh, we are very glad to, uh, today to um, introduce you this, this new webinar called Initiation to Point of Care Ultrasound in General Practice with a focus on uh, abdominal ultrasound. We're going to spend one hour together. And uh, as you already know, we like to make this event uh, very uh, interactive. So feel free to ask any question you have in the Q&A uh, window of, the, of this webinar. And we will take the time at the end of this webinar to answer as many questions as possible. The, 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 the hour we're going to spend together will be uh, structured in uh, three times. First, I will uh, remind you of uh, what Sonoscanner, what we're doing, what, uh, how we can assist you in your, in your project. Then we're going to um, listen to Dr. Speaker's uh, presentation. And we will have, which is very unique and uh, I think very beneficial for, for everyone, a live demo when you can uh, see the, the different points worth of scanning in abdominal scanning. So it's, uh, it's going to be a great hour we're going to spend together. I'm very excited about it. A few words about Sonoscanner. Uh, we've been funded in 2003. We have more than 3,500 physicians around the world using our device every day. And we, uh, we, we, we sell our device worldwide. So uh, wherever you are, there is a, a Sonoscanner nearby that will be uh, very uh, ready to, to serve you. Our focus is ultrasound imaging, and we have a full range of dedicated devices. We have the RKO XQ, which is the premium system with a big edge screen, a touch, touch screen, and four active probes for intensive use. We have our best seller, RKO Lite. Uh, with, uh, it's a laptop system with integrated battery, and we have a, a, a HD 15 inch screen, integrated reporting, and uh, HD image quality. And of course, uh, as you know, we are the leader in the handled segment. So we're very, we're very proud to, uh, to, to offer uh, the U-Lite and the T-Lite as ultra portable system with a seven inch and 10 inch uh, screen solution. And with this device, you can accommodate any kind of probes, including the, the, the face the ray, the endocavitary, and uh, even the hockastic probe. You have all the Doppler modes, which is very unique, and especially the pulse wave Doppler and the tissue Doppler. And why is it so important to have all these those features in, in your device? It's because you can use it in an emergency department, in intensive care, uh, in, in, in a POCUS segment. As you will see in, this, uh, in the few slides here, uh, in, in, the, in the past few weeks, we have uh, been serving a lot of needs in uh, intensive care, especially to fight the COVID. And uh, the, some physicians around the, around the world send us the pictures and uh, we are, thanks a lot to them for, for sharing their, their everyday uh, work and uh, a, a proof of uh, the use of the ULITE. So these are the pictures from the east of France, which has, has been very, uh, very uh, hardly eaten by the virus at the beginning of the, the crisis. And they, they received the ULITE and sent us a picture. These pictures are from the French uh, well-known uh, hospital, the Pitié Salpêtrière. Uh, they're using the ULITE in the, in the pneumology departments for, for a few months now. We also have the, the firefighters uh, in the south of France using the ULITE uh, for their medical uh, Staff. Here it's a uh, very special images. Uh, thank you a lot to uh, Pierre Bernatas uh, for, for sharing this, uh, this image of the ULITE used on the COVID patients. I think this picture has been taken in April. 
and the picture we took uh, recently in Marseille Hospital in the intensive care unit for, for a checkup of uh, the device by Dr. Blasco. This is another uh, testimonial of the, the ULIT uh, useful in the COVID crisis in the, in the north of France with all the, the staff uh, around the device. This is a picture uh, we took yesterday when we were in the south of France uh, visiting, uh, visiting a site. This is a, a chopper on the top of the Toulon's hospital. And in this chopper, uh, there is now a, a U-light that stays here and which is uh, ready to scan uh, for very um, emergency uh, uh, fast exam. So uh, we, we met uh, the, the great team of Toulon Hospital uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to know that they can now use this, this device and help the patients with uh, our technology. And uh, finally, this picture is from the, the production department. I asked them to, to, to send me a picture. And this is a, a shipment we made for Africa. Uh, we are very glad and uh, very honored to be able to, to assist uh, African countries in, uh, in this crisis and, uh, and after it. So uh, this is a uh, tens of uh, Oculite system that's going to be used in uh, Togo and Senegal in the, in the next weeks. So here we are for ultrasound. We, are the, we have a solution for your needs. Either it's a stationary system, a laptop, or ultra portable. All our devices are manufactured by us here in France, in, uh, in the south of Paris. If you visit Paris, feel free to, to, to join, to, to visit us. It will, be a, it will be a great pleasure. You have here uh, our contact. You can ask uh, Roland Lafour for any uh, detailed quotation that you may need. You also have my, uh, my contact, Etienne Richard. Feel free to, uh, to drop me an email, to, uh, to, to, to call me, to, to follow us on LinkedIn. We'll be very happy to connect and assist you in your, in your project. So thanks a lot. Now I give the, the speech to uh, Dr. Hervé Picard for this uh, uh, great presentation, and I, I will meet you at the end of this, uh, this webinar. Thank you very much. So welcome to this, uh, this webinar. Uh, up. We're well, not in the beginning. Here we are. So, point of care ultrasound in general practice, the abdomen. Basically, uh, to start with, uh, it's classical now to uh, disclaim uh, interests. So, uh, as for me, I do receive honorarium from Sonoscanner for this webinar and others. I also received honorarium from a company called Beta DX for consultancy uh, on the biology device. Uh, I am a general practitioner working in Paris and using ultrasound since many years now in my day to day practice. I am no uh, sonologist, I am no specialist in medical imaging, just the ordinary round the corner GP with a practice in ultrasound. And this is what I'm going to try and share with all of you this evening. The webinar's philosophy is uh, mostly practical. So we'll try to focus on practical demonstrations rather than theory. And we wanna be accessible both to people who never ever uh, held a probe in their hands and try to give a little something that's useful to people who already are slightly seasoned in ultrasound. The idea is also to develop a sono clinical approach. So it's a neologism uh, that I coined. Uh, the idea being that uh, we don't do the same kind of ultrasound that uh, specialists in medical imaging do. We do something different that's a mix between clinical practice and sonography. And that's what makes the specificity of our approach and what makes its richness. So we'll discuss that in more depth later. 
The idea is also to be capable of answering simple yes or no questions, thanks to ultrasound uh, in the end of this webinar. We'll start with uh, the basics of the basics. Very, very simple stuff that probably many of you already do know, but it's always good to reach the basics. What is an ultrasound image in short? It's a slice of a patient. A slice that's visualized diametrically and in real time with unavoidable and sometimes useful artifacts. Therefore, when one images an organ, one needs to understand clearly the orientation of the probe and the image. Where are we looking and how are we cutting the patient in a slice? And uh, we need to be sure that we have seen the organ in its entirety, which means sliding to have several parallel cuts of the organ, and also always have perpendicular slices of the same organ to be sure that one has seen everything that can be seen. One also needs to know major artifacts, just not to fall into common pitfalls, but also because they're useful to identify some kind of structures. We'll see that in a few minutes. Orientation. We have three major planes to slice the patient. The axial plane, we will slice the patient like this. That's a transverse plane. The coronal plane, we slice the patient like this. Just imagine the patient wearing the crown this way, and you'll cut in the plane of the crown. And then there is the sagittal plane, which goes this way, central or parallel to the center. When we're cutting the patient in the sagittal plane, this is what we have at the screen. You remember that there is an orientation to the probe. There is a little marker here that shows the, uh, if I put my finger here, one cannot see the screen, but we see in the screen that indeed this part corresponds to the left part of the screen, which is correct, which corresponds to this little dot here. So when we are correctly oriented, the head of the patient is at the left part of the image, the feet of the patient at the right part, superficial is at the top of the image, and death is at the bottom of the image. Conversely, when we go for a transverse plane, it's exactly like what we have in a CT scan. The right of the patient is at the left of the image. The left of the patient is at the right of the image. And you have to imagine that the patient's feet are in front of the screen and the patient's head is behind the screen. You've got a slice of an imaginary patient and it's always useful to try and Imagine the patient's body and where exactly your slice is cutting his body. Probe manipulation is kind of like uh, flying a plane. You can move the probe in several directions and I'll try to show you on our model. Let's see, I can slide the probe laterally, that is going this way. I also can move the probe forwards or backwards, that's this way. Then I can roll my probe, that is twisting it this way. Mm. We don't need the image of the scanner. 
touch me. Just give the image of C in the model. It's best to have some new devon diploma. Good measures going on. So we can roll that cease movement. We can pitch that cease movement. And we can you that this movement. And you always have to wonder when rolling the probe like that or pitching the probe like this. You're trying to image more towards the bottom, the slice of patient. Just imagine there is an imaginary fan that goes like this. And this fan is going to slice our patient as I just cut the patient with a fan. If I'm fanning down, it's probably but I want to look more towards the feet. I should probably not fan, but slide the probe this way. Conversely, if I start to slide towards the cranial part of the patient, I probably want to see something that's more cranial, and I probably have a better image sliding my probe towards the head. Same thing, when you go this way or that way, you're probably trying to see something that's more towards the patient's right. And it's probably a better idea to move the probe this way and to remain perpendicular to the patient. So always keep in mind that you have in your hand kind of a magical invisible fan that's going to go inside the patient's body and cut it so you can see what's happening inside. Mm. Basics of image formation. Well, we won't go into complicated physics. Uh, I wouldn't be capable of it, and I'm not sure it's needed for what we do today, but let's pretend. Let's pretend everything happens as if. In water, the ultrasound wave just passes through without sending back any echo. It just goes through. On the contrary, when hitting air, the ultrasound wave just don't pass and is reflected, comes back towards the probe. When hitting bone, the ultrasound don't pass either, but they are absorbed. Therefore, they almost don't come back to the probe or very little. In other tissues, passes through are partially absorbed and sends back echo that will make the image. There is, of course, a affirmation with uh, absorption. The farther you go from the probe, the less ultrasound you have coming back, because most of them already came back. That's why the machine is calibrated to compensate for that, that's for TGC time gain compensation and make sure that the image is homogeneous towards the entire image. The time for an echo to come back towards the probe will tell us uh, the distance where the image is. Ecogenicity is, is pretty simple. Uh, if you have something that looks whiter than its environment, it will be called hyperechoic. If it looks the same shade of gray 
as its environment, it will be called isoechoic. If it's a darker shade of gray, it will be called hypoechoic. And if it's completely black, it will be called anechoic, which means no echo is coming back. These are some, some common artifacts. We won't go through all artifacts today because it would be a lot. But let's see those that you won't miss. This is acoustic enhancement. This is an image of the liver. And here is either a blood vessel or the gold bladder. It's difficult to tell. Probably a vessel. It's a structure which is anechoic. No echo is coming back from this structure. And as you can see, behind the structure, it looks brighter than in the environment. It's called acoustic enhancement. The mechanism is pretty simple. Uh, the ultrasound goes through this area of liquid without being absorbed, whereas those who go through this part of the liver are being absorbed. So the amount of ultrasound reaching this area here is more intense here than here, because here they have been previously absorbed by this area, whereas here they have not been absorbed. As the system compensates absorption to make sure the level of gray is homogeneous towards the entire axis, in this area we have an overcompensation which makes this whitish zone behind fluids. Acoustic enhancement is a signature artifact for fluid, means water or blood or bile or urine, whatever, but it is a liquid. If you see acoustic enhancement, this is a liquid. Now, acoustic shadowing is Kind of the opposite. This is a gold ladder with two magnificent gallstones that you can see here. They're acting like bone. This is calcium. It's solid and absorbing the ultrasound. So of course when the ultrasound beam hits the stone, an echo will come back towards the core and makes this whitish line telling us that there is something here. But then, the ultrasound are absorbed by the gallstone. Therefore, there is no more ultrasound going through afterwards. It is even more visible in this big gallstone, where everything is being absorbed, and there is no more ultrasound behind it, and therefore, no more image. So this is kind of the opposite of the acoustic enhancements. This is the acoustic shadowing. And this means structures that absorb ultrasound. This means bone or stone. Forgive me. Other artifacts, mirror image. This is kind of common along the diaphragm. What you see here is a liver. This is the diaphragm. And this here is all artifacts. There is a focal lesion in the liver right here. And apparently, there is a twin focal lesion, just the other side of the diaphragm. It's in fact purely fake purely artifactual. What happens is what you can see on the right part of the slide. The ultrasound beam is reflected by the liver as by a mirror, 
goes towards the structure, is reflected by the structure, goes back to the mirror, and back again towards the probe. But the probe always assumes that echoes coming back to it come straight in the axis of the beam. So the probe will assume that what comes in fact from here, it will assume that it comes from there. And because the time the beam took to go here, there, and there, and back here, this time is longer than this time, the probe will assume that the image is slightly further than the mirror. This creates this mirror image, and it's very easy to get rid of it if you move your probe, change the axis of the beam, the mirror image will either disappear or move, which shows that it's fake. Whereas the true image will remain in place independently of the axis of the slice. Other artifacts, edge artifacts. This is something that's very common. You'll we'll see it. This is also a cyst or a vessel or a fluid containing structure. And as you can see, there is posterior enhancement artifact. So then there is also whoops, this tiny shadow here and tiny shadow there on the border of the structure. These are very common artifacts. It's due to diffusion of the ultrasound beam at the corner when they hit the corner of the structure. Again, if you change the angle of the beam, they will disappear or move, whereas true structure remain in place. The elaboration artifacts to finish with this review uh, is caused by the fact that the ultrasound beam, this is annoying, this, the beam hits a structure, this is the wrap, and hitting a structure with air behind it, the beam will reflect and go back to the probe, where it creates the image of the pleura. But then, it will be reflected by the probe and go back to the pleura, where it will be reflected once again and go back to the probe. And as previously is the mirror image artifact, the probe will assume that there is something at twice this distance in the axis of the beam. So it will create this whitish line, which is called the A line in the line. And then it repeats three times, and you have it again. When the interface has a very, very strong uh, difference in acoustic impedance with the environment, the reverberation is even more intense and you have what we call a comet tail. That's this kind of line with small lines repeating after each other. And yet again, these artifacts will move and change as you move the probe. So let's try and see how we can um, make our first images and try uh, and get a hand on the knobs of this machine. So, knobology or the art of dealing with all that's on the system. Thanks to Sonoscanner and Sam Gold, these machines are particularly simple to use and user friendly. This is not the case of all devices, and you can have uh, ultrasound machines that look like the common panel of some interstellar vessel. 
here, uh, everything is pretty simple and pretty straightforward. So, uh, uh, I still have things to show on my slide. So, what to know on Mars? First things first, the probe frequency is key to the image quality and the depth of the image. Higher frequency means more detail, more definition, but less depth. Depending on what you want to image, we have a very thin model here, so we can use quite high frequencies to see that if we had kind of, a, let's say, fatter person, we might need a probe that has a smaller frequency, so we can go deeper through the layers of fat. There is always a focal zone. I'll show it to you in a few minutes on the screen. This is where the image is at its best quality. You can adjust the focal manually, but in most machines, and particularly in some surveillance machines, it adjusts automatically depending on uh, the depth you set. And there is a gray scale. You can change the gain to have an image that's whiter or darker. And as a rule of thumb, most beginners tend to go for a too white image. So if you're wondering whether it's too white or too dark, probably slightly too white. Let's have a demonstration on our model. I can go to the scan. So I am sorry, it's going to be cold again. So, first of all, uh, we're here, I guess. So, first of all, my probe. This is the indicator that tells us where is the left part of the screen. One way to know it is to take a little gel and put your finger on the probe. As you can see on the screen, I am here on the left part of the image. I am here on the right part of the image. This indicator, this left part of the image, should be orientated towards the patient's right when you scan this way. So this is, well, we have a really uh, super duper echogenic patient. So we have a nice view of uh, intra-abdominal blood vessels and pancreas. But here we won't go right away into detail. The question is, what do we see? Let's take a slice of liver. So. If you see the angulation of my probe, I am trying to remain as perpendicular as possible to the patient's skin. I'm also trying to keep my hand close to the patient and I often put my hands on the patient's skin so I remain more stable. We have here I'm sliding. What you can see here is the patient's gallbladder. It has little folds in it, which is very common. It's not extremely full of bile, which makes me guess that this patient ate something at lunchtime and emptied his gallbladder because there was some fat in his lunch. Is at least not fasting since this morning. As you can see, we do have posterior enhancements here behind the gallbladder. This pulsating structure 
is obviously a vessel. It's most probably an artery. And again, you have some level of posterior enhancement. So to review, this is the hepatic texture. This is anechoic. This is hyperechoic, just in front. This is almost isoechoic, slightly hypoechoic towards what's there, but this is artifactual. And if you put your probe here, this is a very classical thing, we will review it in a few minutes, but you're having a possibility to change that. This is way too deep. Our patient is very thin, so we can afford to have a depth this way and to increase slightly the gain. Here, my, my image is a little too white, but for technical purposes, to make it more visible on the internet, I'll keep it that way. So what do you have? You have the backbone here, which does absorb the ultrasound, so there is absorption behind. This is the spine. You have pulsating here the abdominal aorta, and you have the vena cava here. If I release the pressure, you see that the vena cava appears bigger, and if I increase my pressure, I can compress my vena cava, or well, his vena cava actually, to a point where it almost collapses. Whereas I can apply as much pressure as I want on the aorta, the pressure inside is way too much, it's not compressible. So this is a normal image. By the way, we'll see it again, but let's start it. If we want to measure, um, how do I put a caliper on this machine? Thank you. If we want to measure this diameter, it's, well, let's say 13 millimeters. It's way less than 2.5. This is a normal diameter for an aorta in the abdomen. There is no ecstasy, no aneurysm. So we'll come back to the slideshow and then we'll come back again to our young model in a few minutes. I guess. Right. So, basic ultrasound in the abdomen for the GP. What should we look for? There are basically two types of questions you can have when no really starting. And of course, if you're a seasoned sonologist, you can answer many more questions. So if you're a beginner, there are a few things where you can be easily sure. To these questions, every beginner can give a clear-cut answer. The learning curve has been studied. In, in studies in American universities, and you know that uh, it takes between 30 and 50 exams before practitioners reach a plateau where they don't improve the quality of their exams. That means when you have done 30 scans for abdominal aorta, for instance, you're at the mark. When you have done 40 scans to see if there is pelvic and serial dilation, 
your algebra. So what are these questions where you can answer yes or no? Well, on kidneys and bladder, you can answer yes or no to the question, is there a urinary retention? Yes, no. Is there pelvic aliceal dilation in the kidneys? Let's see. This on the left is a normal full bladder. It has a squarish shape. This is a massive retention. This was one of my patients who didn't pass urine since uh, more than two and a half days. So you can measure the volume of urine, but the mere fact that the bladder is this spherical void shape is a telltale sign that this is a urinary retention. Pelvic aliceal dilatation. This is a normal kidney. You can see it is a right kidney. This is what we call Morrison's pouch. We will go back to it in a minute. But this is the liver. This is a kidney. And you can see the kidney cortex, which is hypoechoic. And the kidney sinus, which is subversely hypoechoic. In this case, you don't see calyx. On the other hand, this again is uh, one of my patients who had severe pelvic aliceal dilation. You can see that the cavities in the kidney are full of fluid here. This is pelvic aliceal dilatation, and this is a sign that there is something really wrong and that the patient should probably be seen by a urologist rapidly because depending on the situation, it can be either something acute, and this is uh, putting the kidney in danger, or something chronic, and this kidney is probably poorly functioning. Abdominal aorta aneurysm. This is a study, there are many, to um, identify whereas it's useful to check for triple A in elderly patients in GP. The answer is yes. To put things very simply, more or less 5% of adults uh, older than 65 years of age have an uh, aorta abdominal aneurysm. Five persons, that's much. If they are smokers, it's probably around 10 persons. One patient out of 10. If you have a triple A and it's big, if it's very big, like seven centimeters in diameter, the probability that it blows up within a year is more than 50%. And the lethality of rupture triple A is extremely high. Whereas if you treat it when it's not ruptured, you'll cure the patient. So it's a frequent disease, at least not infrequent. It's potentially fatal. It's relatively easy to treat when diagnosed early. And the diagnosis is super duper simple. We have seen it five minutes ago. I'll show it to you once again. And the studies, and there are several, show that any GP with a very minimal training in ultrasound can adequately check for triple A. This is an image that you have already seen in our young colleague. This is the vertebral body. This is the aorta in the inferior vena cava. You can see that here the aortic diameter is roughly normal. This is a triple A with a thrombus. You can see that the diameter 
is absolutely massive compared to the vertebral body, which is here, and that there is clotting all around. This is, of course, a surgical emergency. IVC, what can you tell on the IVC? This is a cut that I will show you in a few minutes. This is liver IVC. We're cutting the patient like this. The heart is here. And the IVC, as you will see, does breathe as the patient realizes. The normal IVC moves with respiration. If the patient is hyperbolic, which you can see, for instance, in ICU, if you have two heavy hands on uh, IV fluids, then it won't collapse when the patient breathes. Conversely, in patients with hypovolemia, because they're bleeding or they're in shock, you will see a collapsed IVC, which doesn't increase in diameter when the patient breathes. Last but not least, uh, is a free fluid in the abdomen. This is Morrison's pouch. Again, kidney, liver. And here you can see this black slide, which has nothing to do with this area, which is fluid between the liver and the kidney. This is the glass pouch. This is in the lady. The bladder is here. The uterus is here. And the Douglas pouch is here. It should be invisible. The fact that it's visible is anechoic images, i.e. fluids, show that there is free fluid in the abdomen. And this is, on the other side, this clino-renal pouch. Again, the spleen is here, kidney is here, and you can see there is an image of fluids. Oh, I don't know if my mouse is visible. Yes, there is an image of fluid here between the two. So, these are the questions. Yes or no? Is there a urinary tension? Is there pelvic alicial dilation? Is there triple A? Hypovolemia or hypovolemia? Is there intra abdominal free fluids? So we'll go to the patient and check for all of this. Go back Is there a urinary retention? I'm going towards the bladder. Sorry, it's going to be cold. This is a very nice image of the patient's bladder. It's almost full, so I won't push too much because probably the patient would like to go empty his bladder okay, soon. But you see the squarish shape. So it's typically not a retention. Is there pelvic alicial dilation? We'll go here on the right side of the patient and try and get the image of his Morrison's pouch. It's absolutely magnificent. We have a very, very nice image here with the kidney cortex, medulla, the liver, and this extremely thin hyperechoic line that here is the very limited amount of fat that's between the liver and the kidney. In most patients, you will see more of it, but this patient is particularly thin, so the amount of fat is almost nil, at least you can be sure that there is no image whatsoever of fluids 
in this area. So there is no free fluid in the Morrison's pouch. Then we'll go towards the other side of the patient, towards the splenorenal area. Est-ce que tu peux mettre ta main comme ceci, s'il te plaît? Merci. So it helps to have the patient put his hands like this, to lift the ribs and have a better image. To visualize the spleen and the left kidney, just remember that it's always more towards the back of the patient and toward the head of the patient than you expect. So I always put my hands on the bed like that and then on the patient and hop. Here we go again. It's too easy with your plan. This here is a spleen. We have, of course, rib shadows, but that's part of the game. This here is a spleen. And this here, spleen, left kidney. You can visualize the spleen is slightly more echoic than the liver, which explains the difference of echogenicity between the spleen and the renal cortex. And here again, there is absolutely no free fluid. And of course, don't be mistaken, this here is not fluid, it's an artifact. It's shadowing, it's absorption shadowing, because there is a rib. And you can see that because if you move your probe, you move the artifacts. And if you go to check the entire area, absolutely no free, free fluids. Let's have a look at the vena cava. So here I'm slicing the patients this way. And I will slide my probe towards the patient's right and left. The first image I will see is this image. It's the liver here. And this pulsating structure is a longitudinal image of the aorta. Then if I slide towards the right, I leave the aorta and reach the vena cava. You can see that the patient's heart is beating here. The vena cava is entering the heart at this level. And this, est-ce que tu peux respirer profondément, s'il te plaît? When I ask the patient to breathe deeply, encore, Inhale, the vena cava collapses. Exhale, it becomes bigger. This is a normally breathing vena cava. No hypervolemia, no hypovolemia. Great image. So we checked for many things where we could have very, very simple answers in a few seconds. Let's go back to my all time favorites the aortic abdominal aneurysm. So this is too easy. So this is very high. We're going towards the patient's feet. This is the suprarenal aorta. Then sliding down in many patients, you will lose the image of the aorta because of the small intestine. In his case, it's so thin that we don't lose it. It becomes more superficial as we go down. And here, you can see, if I go a little more down, the aorta becomes two. This is 
the aortic bifurcation towards the common iliac arteries. So you have followed the abdominal aorta in its entirety. This is the infrarenal part of the aorta. This higher is the suprarenal part. I'm lacking a little gel here. You have seen it all the way and the diameter is always 12 millimeters here. Basically, it's normal below 2.5 centimeters starts to be pathological after three centimeters in diameter and you really, really should worry after five. After five, call a vascular surgeon. And with that, we have seen all the yes, no questions that we could answer easily. Now we go back to the slideshow. These are Oh, yes, no questions. These are more complicated questions. These are the questions of the type, yes, I'm sure, or uh, well, I just don't know. These are things that if you see them, they're here for sure. If you don't see them, maybe they're not here. Maybe they're very small and difficult to see. Maybe you lack training and didn't scan the organ in its entirety. So I wouldn't conclude absence of if you don't see them. But if you see them, of course it's present. Examples focal or multiple hepatic lesions, gallstones, kidney stones, intrauterine pregnancy. Let's have a look. This here is the liver of one of my patients. He came one fine evening in my outpatient department and complained of slight fever and slight pain in the right upper quadrant. The image of his liver is that. And there is a very, very clear hypoechoic intrahepatic focal lesion in the context of course fever we think abscess and indeed it was hepatic abscess that was during the very same evening steatosis this is a nice one because you'll see it kind of often you know that nash non-alcoholic uh, steatosis hepatitis is quite frequent uh, in many counties. It has a prevalence that has been estimated around 30 percent. That's fatty liver disease. And the main culprits are uh, beverage with lots of sugar and poor um, food habits. Normally, the liver ecogenicity is almost the same as the ecogenicity of the kidney cortex. You could see, see this perfectly in our model. Here, obviously, the liver is way more ecogenic than the kidney cortex. This is what we call a liver-kidney gradient of ecogenicity, and this strongly suggests theatosis. Maybe if it's mild, you'll miss it. But if it's obvious, then you can probably consider discussing uh, food hygiene with a patient, losing weight, and running a panel of 
liver enzymes because there might be teratogenic ketides. Surprises in the gallbladder. These are obvious gallstones. I mean, everything is here. The gallbladder is very nice. You have the image of the stone, then you have the absorption artifacts behind. These are gallstones. You can be sure of it. If you see no gallstone, well, maybe there is a very, very tiny one and you didn't scan the gallbladder in the entirety. Once you get more experience, once you get more seasoned in a dominant ultrasound, you'll be able to say, okay, the gold barrier is clear. But in the beginning, just don't be sure. But if stones are here, they're here for sure. Uterus. You can have two surprises in the uterus. This in the uterus here. And you can see a very nice hyperechoic line here. This is a copper intrauterine device. It's, by the way, in place because the distance between the back of the uterus and the device is less than 2.5 centimeters. And you also can have the surprise of discovering an intrauterine pregnancy. This is an IUP around seven weeks. If you don't see an IUP, please, don't conclude there is none. It may be very soon and there is nothing to see. Maybe it's extra uterine. You don't rule out a pregnancy with an ultrasound, but you can rule it in if it's present. You can rule out an I a copper IUD, that's true. The non-copper IUDs, the hormonal IUDs, are less easy to see, and you can miss them. But again, the entire point here is to say that there are stuff where you can say yes if it's present, and say nothing if it's absent. And with this, we have done our little tour of the abdominal ultrasound basics. Now I'm open to every questions you might have. That's great. Thank you very much, Dr. Picard. Very interesting. Is, is there any any question from the audience? You can you can ask the question in French if you prefer. No, no problem. We will translate. No questions, but I hope uh, I wasn't too boring. It was perfect. It was perfect. Very I clear. Appreciate it. So then, uh, I guess we can conclude, Etienne. The sure. Show entirely yours. Sure. Thank. Thank you very much, Dr. Picard, for this. Uh, this, this great presentation, uh, it has been live on YouTube, but I think uh, our team will, uh, will make it available for, for people interested in, uh, in reviewing all the information you shared with us today. So thanks a lot. Uh, we, we will right now remind you of the useful contact you have here in Sono Scanner. So you can ask uh, Roland and, and, and myself for, for any inquiry. We still have one webinar next week. Thanks, thanks Samuel and Marie. We have one webinar next week in, uh, in French about the, the focus and cardiac ultrasound. So uh, feel free to register to this great event, uh, the last of the season. And then we will uh, get back to, to you live on, uh, on September for a great program we put together with lots of, um, of, uh, of great webinar. So thank you very much. Here the information, feel free to, to ask us uh, more questions if you have.
if we don't see you before the end of the summer, have a great summer. Be careful on the street. I know there are some new lights uh, in the chopper, etc. But we will love them to stay <laughs> switched off. So uh, take care of yourself, of, uh, of your family. And uh, see you very soon. Thank you very much.